Good morning and welcome back. This is Brad Furlan, your host on Vermont Viewpoint. I'm your Monday host. There's other hosts during the week, but we, we have Monday here and we love Monday and I like being part of your, the beginning of your week and I hope it's starting out well if you're in your car or in your living room or, uh, like me this morning, I was out in the barn throwing hay to the sheep and I didn't bring them out to pasture this morning. It just seemed like too onerous. So they're going, Attica, Attica. They wanted to get out, but I didn't let them out. So uh, that's the way it went. My next guest is returning, uh, a good friend of mine from Elmore, Vermont, and he's got a whole lot of hats like my my uh, first guest this morning. I want to welcome you to the show, Connell O'Brien. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back here. I'll mention that one of your hats was you were the director of All of My Children and the Young and the Restless. So you were here in March, and if I said uh, that Connell O'Brien and Brad Furlan were in the living room and they're heading to the kitchen, in soap opera time, have we made it to the kitchen yet? Probably not. No, that probably would start on Monday. We might get there on Friday. Okay. And, and there'll be something dramatic that would tie you over to the next Monday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and probably something in the kitchen that... Yeah, could be. Yes, definitely. You you have someone from your past that mysteriously is going to stand up and say something shocking. It's possible. It's yeah. possible. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's... So people uh, understand your... Your professional and personal development, you were acting was in your family, your parents? Yeah, my, my, both my parents were actors. They met actually at drama school at, uh, it was then called Carnegie Tech, uh, now called Carnegie Mellon, very uh, good drama school in Pittsburgh. And, uh, my mother started having children, of which she had 10, of one of 10. So that kind of killed her acting career. But my dad worked his entire career as an actor, raised that family of 10, worked all sorts of different media, uh, film, mostly stage, some soap opera. He was on Dark Shadows, which is uh, kind of, you say that to most soap fans and they go, oh, I love that show. And did all, all the soaps. And he was instrumental in helping me get from there to here. It was very supportive of my career, very supportive of me being in theater and then in television. Um, I also trained with a man named B.H. Barry, and B.H. Barry is a master director and also specialized in fight choreography, sword fights and punch-up and throwing chairs at people. And I studied with him at school, um, and then I apprenticed with him after. And from that trade, from that idea. I went and choreographed a fight at All My Children a very long time ago, and it went great. I hit it off with the people there, notably with the senior director, and I started training with him to learn the craft of directing soaps, because it's different than the work I was doing as a stage director. And if somebody was difficult to write for, you just kill them off? Is that- <laughs> <laughs> Not personally, but <laughs> it's possible I've heard that story somewhere. <laughs> but notably, therefore, the people who last a long time doing what they're doing is just the opposite. They're good to work with, they know their stuff, the audience likes them, and they have heart and they have reason to do it. People like Susan Lucci on All My Children, Beth Maitland on Young and the Restless, who's a very good friend and has been very supportive of my writing, which is the new aspect of where I'm going and what I'm doing now as I'm writing. And I'm not writing soap, I'm writing murder mystery, and uh, it's a whole different genre and um, much to my delight, Beth is a major murder mystery fan and a major fan of Agatha Christie, which I am too. And she's been just delightful and helpful and uh, putting out the word for my books. I listened to that interview and uh, the camaraderie between you is evident. And and also the, you know, you, you both cherish the 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 writing and the murder mystery uh, format. And do you develop a, a social relationship as well as a professional relationship? Or is sure. that? No, it can happen. Yeah. Beth Maitland's become a very good friend. Yeah. Obviously, there's people I've been working with and know for, oh, 30, 35 years that uh, Peter Bergman, who's a main star on Young and the Restless, started out on All My Children. When I go in to do my first thing at All My Children, Peter's the leading man of that show. <laughs> And, you know, time changes. You get hired. You get drafted. People that, and you went to California and went to YNR. And Peter's a good friend. You just, these are the people, you know, there's, it's, it's a very small enterprise soap in, in a lot of ways, even though 
people think of it as, as a widespread network yeah. idea. Connell, you started in New York. Is that where you first directed? Yes. And then you went out to California. More recently, but yes, that's true. I was and, in New York for the, most of my career. Most of your career. And was it um, – was California just – it was a different soap and that's where it was being filmed or – Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Put briefly, my – Dad was failing and did die, in fact, in the year 2010. And that's also the year that all my children left New York and temporarily moved to California where it finished. I didn't go with the show at that time because I wanted to be you know, near my dad. And he died that year. Towards the end of that year, I got a call from the producer, the then producer of YNR, asking me to come out. And I thought, all right, it's a new door is open let's let's try that uh for i did that for about six years and that was the perfect time for that and that's how i got there so you left uh the big city we would say <laughs> and you moved to the little town uh hmm, i suppose we we needed a, a change first of all my career was shifting by determination i've been writing since i was in my teens i'd written some screenplays i'd produced a couple of short films i had done some stuff for theater but the television work is all involving it's all you do is the television work except i'd steal away some time and write stuff and i realized i had hit a career shift and wanted to write full time you can most definitely do that in the city, but with it, I just wanted a quieter place. I wanted some place more contemplative, and thank God Gwen agreed, and and we just decided to take a plunge. We had looked about in different places, northern California, up in Canada, and we couldn't quite find the place that resonated, and we just decided to go explore Vermont. It was January. It was freezing. We rented a car and started tooling around. We wanted to see if we could deal with the cold. We're people from the city, you know, and we could. And it was something real and refreshing and healing and Vermont. And it's it can't you, you can't really wave a flag about it. It's, it's not that it's very quiet, <clears throat> but it's something that we needed. So we moved. We rented out a house. We had the greatest landlord in the world down in the Moscow area of Stowe. We stayed there for three years. And then we were looking, of course, for a place for ourselves, and we found it up in Elmore. And yeah, I've written two books. <laughs> and the third one is in the oven, and that's Vermont. It gave me what I needed. Gwen's teaching up here. Everything is is working for us, and we're very grateful. It's in the right place. It's almost cliche, right? Uh. Well, I, you know, there's a lot of writers here. You're a writer. I'm a writer. And you have writers on, and God bless you for that, on your program. Vermont is filled with creative people, painters, writers, poets of you know, the, the works, and photographers, God knows, because it is nurturing for that. And yes, you can say, well, I'm a photographer. It's a beautiful place. It's hard to take a bad shot here. But it's also just the people and the land, it's, it is, I suppose, a little cliche, but it's, it's been wonderful to be here. I am a member of uh, Vermont League of Writers, which is really a, a great organization and has a plethora of writers and, and you know, uh, editors and all this. Uh, and one of the uh, editor uh People at the last gathering said that you write your first book your whole life. Did that is that have some accuracy for you? Definitely. My older brother Vince, he he read the first book, uh, Birth of the Angel, and he he said, "So how much of this is about us and you?" And I just started laughing. I said, "All of it. Is it anything about us?" Literally, no, of course not. But everything that you go through, every person that you meet, people from your family. Things that you remember, they echo in when you don't expect them to. You're writing something and all of a sudden it just comes and you think about it like a month later. Where did that come from? Where did I hear that from? And it's everything. It's exactly what you're saying. Your life matters and it matters if you can express it. It really matters what you get, what you reach back for. So you had this full book in you and then it, it, you you started actually putting it to print in Elmore? Uh, no, actually, we were still in the Stowe area okay. at that point. Yeah. And that one was just at the beginning of COVID. Right. Finished it. It was um, the very first months of COVID were just starting. 
uh, and I had to pull it. We pulled it from publication. I brought it back. I had to rewrite it completely because the main character, the investigator named Artemis Bookbinder, is a bona fide germaphobe. Book's supposed to be taking place right now. So I thought people are going to read this. There is this international pandemic and the germaphobe doesn't seem to notice it. No one's wearing a mask. It was, it was impossible. So I rewrote it and it became, I think, much, much richer with the complication of germaphobe in the world of COVID. This is his journey then. It, it takes a tremendous act of courage for him to open the doors and step out because of the things he needs to do. And I think a lot of people resonated with that because it was a very difficult time. It's a metaphor too, right? It's, yes. Um, mm -hmm. we, we all have trouble stepping out on a lot of things in life. Uh, Amen. So birth of the angel, I have a, I'm looking at this copy and it's a, um, it's one of two and now, and then three, but, the Gardner Museum robbery, real life. Right. That's uh, where it starts. March 1990, a real life robbery in the Gardner Museum in Boston. Thirteen treasures have never been found. That's real. That's not fiction and is a disaster for the world. But my story, the fictional story, starts with what if one of those pieces was found and what if found next to it was a dead body? And that's where the story begins. And that's the quest and the journey. All right, the bookstore phones are ringing off the hook right now and the online purchases because just that, if you, if you don't want to read the book after hearing that, I don't know. Maybe you don't, whatever. So we were talking about birth of the angel, the Gardner Museum robbery. One thing that, um, intrigues me about this, did you have any, uh, sort of sidebar hope that this book might open up the the case in the real world and and that's a very interesting question well uh, it's an interesting idea because what if you stirred up the hornet's nest and got yourself in trouble because your supposition of where the pieces are was too close to reality <laughs> yeah. but no it's it's a fiction uh, it, fictional idea the book is of my own invention and yes i've researched this like crazy to see where investigations did go, current investigations are going. They really have turned everything upside down looking for these paintings, never really found a clue of anything. So I do have a theory or two. First of all, the, the first piece is recovered on page one of Birth of the Angel. So it starts right there, and that person who's the dead body on the floor is the clue. And following that led me to a whole journey of what I thought might have happened. It actually is being even more evolved in the book I'm writing now because the series of books has to do the re with the recovery of those art treasures. The murder mystery aspect is one per book. You get a murder mystery happens and is solved inside of one book, but the characters continue because they continue on this quest to find the Gardner Museum stuff. And yes, they may recover some along the way besides just the first one, and that's the story. What do they find? When do they find it? And where does it lead? It's really an art, and I, 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 I'm amazed uh, what, what I just heard you say is – the book is is self-contained, right? Yes. Um, and then you wrote another self-contained book. Yes, and, and the first two linked together a little tighter than even the rest of them will, except for the characters, because the real solving of the first murder mystery happens at the end of the second book. Yeah. But you get enough finishing at the end of the first book to satisfy. And has the writing become a find the soul thing for you? Well, you're back to my brother Vince's question of, is this about us? Is this about you? Yeah, I think it's not overt. It's the writing itself is. that That's the thing I need to do. When I write, I'm happy. I just like it. When I get tied up, now that we lived in Vermont, you step outside and you, you look around. It's very beautiful here. You breathe the air, you feel the soil, and you go back in, you have more stuff to do. That, that feeds my soul. In Birth of the Angel, there are different worlds, the investigator worlds, the criminals, of course, uh, and a TV news group that's always part of the story. That was tons of fun for me to write. Guess why? Yeah. <laughs> because I have this television background, and everything is stirred up in there. That's 
that's the point. You so, get to use it. So many lenses you get to put into one product. With luck, yeah. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Two brilliant books. Uh, we're talking with Connell O'Brien. He's got uh, Birth of the Angel, Death of Television. Uh, you can get these books in local bookstores in Vermont. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you can also go online to Connell O'Brien. Your website is www.connell, which is spelled C-O-N-A-L, O'Brien, O-B-R-I-E-N, connellobrien.com. Uh, these are, these are books worth reading. Uh, so, you know, eventually in, in time, I'll be going, so Connell, this is your 18th book. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> I hope it, it's going well. <laughs> and I'll say, what? I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. We, we're going to get the large print edition. That's, that's right. By that, the, that's why, by the way, we're selling the most books on Amazon Kindle, which I only plug because that's what's great about it. You can make the print as big as you like, which is brilliant. If my mom was still around, she would have loved that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's get to the third book. And I know that you, you've got, you brought some writing and I'm going to, I'm encouraging you and asking you to, to read us read something for us to Thank give a little flavor of the book. I will do. Before I do, I have to say I know that you hike up Elmore Mountain, notably when there's a full moon from time to time or perhaps every month or whenever the weather is most suitable. Why did you start doing that? Well, I've done it for a few years, and it is every full moon uh, year-round. And uh, Elmore Mountain, as you know, at the top has a fire tower. And I, maybe it's I want to be closer to the moon, but really it's <laughs> it's the cathartic journey of going up a mountain. I'm up at night. I'm often alone. I, my dogs come with me. If you hit it right, the, the sun rising or setting over Stowe area is absolutely beautiful from the top of the fire tower. And then the moon rise over Lake Elmore. Um, and as you would guess, sometimes I don't see anything. Because in the middle of the winter and it's snowing hard or whatever, it doesn't happen. But it's my cathartic gig, and I, I've stuck with it. Well, we've talked about this before, and I asked you last time I think we were here, if you would mind if I adapted a little bit of that experience for one of my characters who has a unique relationship with the moon. And you graciously said yes. And so I wrote this. This is the prelude for book three. This is going to be out in 2024. It's definitely not out yet. And this is how it goes. Prelude. The crunchy leaves beneath her boots. The loose play of the flashlight beam scanning the rocky path ahead. Her breath coming out as vapor. Tomorrow was supposed to be hot, maybe even a record breaker for Vermont on the first day of October. But tonight, the air was cold and crisp. Despite that, she unzipped her jacket as she navigated the steep path. She knew the way, even in the darkness. The hike up Elmore Mountain had become a kind of ritual for her, always at night, and only when there was a full moon. The trees opened overhead, and Lucille stepped out onto a small plateau known as the Lookout. From here, she could see the expanse of Elmore Lake far below, glittering magically. She smiled and looked up. The moon seemed unusually large in the star-filled sky. Hello, old friend, she said softly. Sometimes she continued her hike to the summit where an old but well-maintained fire tower stood. The view from the top of the nearly four-story structure, especially on a bright night like this, stretched for miles in all directions, the lake to the east, the Worcester Range to the south, Mount Mansfield to the west, and Canada far off to the north. But she had started out later than usual, and the first light of day was just starting to reach across the sky from the east. It didn't matter. She was just happy to be here, right now. There was a time, not so long ago, when she lived in a city. There she had lost herself in the constant, noisy, urgent challenge of so many people all together, all at once. So she'd left. Lucille sat down on a large rock, pulled out a water bottle and took a drink. A breeze came up the mountain from the east, and rustled through the orange-red leaves all around her. She looked up at the branches overhead and could imagine, as she often did, large faces of the watchers of the forest. And she felt grateful that she was somehow allowed to be here, and she felt a connection to myths and the old stories she had heard about elves and the protectors of dreams. She took a long breath to remember. Then she zipped up her jacket, got up, 
and started back down the path. This is uh, the prelude to book three, uh, Connell O'Brien. I can live and breathe every moment, every word that you just wrote. You got it. You got it so straight. Um, Thanks, Brian. And it's uh, it's it's a beautiful. Um, and I I'm uh, gathering it gets a little dicier after that. <laughs> well, one has requirements in a murder mystery. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I noticed uh, th- there is in the books you you have to give a little bit of an adult warning too. I do, and thank you for saying that. These books are for adult. My my hero in these in this world is Agatha Christie, and her books are cozy. They're meant to be. They feel that way. Uh, my books are for adults insofar as they have adult language in them, and they also have an occasional sexual situation. So thanks for that. It's important to say so people are not surprised. and <laughs> They go, wait a second. Yeah. So um, I asked you this on our last break. We, You post um, from time to time on Facebook, and you post in September about your walk up Elmore Mountain on a kind of a messy night with weather and such. Uh, and I wondered if you wouldn't mind reading that. I know your computer's there, and you could kind of go for it and fire it. But I think this is a tremendous piece of writing, and I'm I'm putting you on the spot this way to encourage you to publish and and do your stuff. Well, I thank you for that, and uh, we'll see if our listeners will indulge me <laughs> for a short short reading here. As we talked about, um, I hike Elmore Mountain every full moon, and the moon isn't always there to see, and, and this is what happened uh, for the, the blue moon of August. There may be some debate if it was a marvelous night for a moon dance on Elmore Mountain. Large clouds loomed above like ancient gods overlooking my journey. The ranger station and parking lot at the trailhead were both empty. The hike began with a drizzle, and I quickly needed my headlamp. The rain varied in intensity, but the heavy mist and the intense darkness lent itself to little visibility. When I can't see well on a trail, I rely on the trees, not above, but the root systems that boldly protrude from the ground after decades of hiking wear. And I think, is it not our roots that often guide our path? My dogs are great companions at adventure, each with lighted collars looking like space aliens crisscrossing a galaxy. A couple times they stopped in their tracks and studied the woods. I called them into me for whatever was out there needed to stay out there. We try to hike in harmony. Hiking without visibility renders contemplation. Where am I on the trail? Where am I in life? I examine a certain loneliness and how it fiercely battles with independence. Do we ever find balance? And about the moon dance, a hike in total downpour, roots from the trees serving as my guide beneath my feet, the glory of the soaking earth, stripping half naked to dry my body at the summit of a mountain, to revel in the splendor of nature's bounty, Marvelous comes in many ways. Well, at least once in a blue moon. Brad, that's great. That's just great. And I, I love that you talked about the roots as the place we come from and what they teach us. This, thank you for reading that. I think that's marvelous. Well, thank you for the prompt. And thank you, uh, radio listeners, for indulging uh, two, two writers who, <laughs> you know, kind of like, like the gig. That's it. Uh, we've been talking uh, for the last hour with Connell O'Brien. He's got three books, uh, two you can uh, purchase right now today, uh, Birth of the Angel, Death of Television is the second one. You heard the prelude to the third one. And I'm I'm so excited about uh, the moon hike part of the novel and also just the the continuation of, of seeking out answers and uh, and life's mysteries. And I know we're closing in up at the end of the hour, but I just want to thank Bridgeside Books here in Waterbury, Katya and, and her people for putting our book on the shelves and, and also Emma 
at uh, Bear Pond Books in Montpelier, and God bless those guys how to rebuild that entire bookshop, and they did. They're back in business. Everybody should go to those bookshops. Please look for my book, but go there anyway and go buy books. Connell O'Brien, my guest, uh, Elmore writer, uh, two books under his belt, and uh, one more coming out soon, and many more after that, we hope. Uh, I want to thank you for um, being my guest this morning. Thank you, Brad, and thank you for reading. I really love that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that offer. Thank you, listeners. We can't do radio without you. Brad Furlan, Vermont Viewpoint.